Hare Krishna Shaman Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Thank you. Wonderful to have you here. And uh, today I thought we could discuss a, a, a very important topic which is often understood quite simplistically. That is uh, democracy. Basically, we could call it something like uh, Gita wisdom or spiritual wisdom and democracy. Or spiritual wisdom and forms of governance. Okay. So, I thought of a roadmap, and you can share your thoughts about how we could do it. We can look at the way the purpose of governance in our spiritual texts, uh, beyond the specifics of governance, the purpose of governance. Then we can look at how that purpose can be served in today's. In which forms of government is that purpose being served best today? And then lastly. What would a uh, what can spiritual wisdom offer to improve those forms of government in today's context? All okay. right. Okay. So now, if we consider that, as far as governance is concerned, although in the Vedic times there was a, largely a system of monarchy, but then that seems to be the system everywhere. it is not just in uh, what is it in the vedic culture it seems to be almost everywhere that was the form of government so whether that form of government is intrinsic or essential to the vedic teachings that is a question that could be conceivably raised and one reason to consider is that that there are just as there are uh, social structures there are political structures and they have a spiritual purpose so we consider dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yuga yuga krishna says in the bhagavad gita so his point is he comes to establish dharma there it clearly refers to order in society and then the purpose of establishing social order is that's that's 48 and 49 says janma karma ch me devyam evam yobiti tatva tatva deham punar janma naiti ma meti swarjana it is ultimately to spiritualize our consciousness to attain and to attain him so the ultimate purpose of material governance is to maintain say order and virtue so that people can pursue spiritual life so in that sense the form of governance we could say it is more instrumental than essential the specific form of government and uh, what any thoughts on this mm, i i very much like this uh, the root of governance is the shas dhatu in sanskrit from there we have shasan governance shasak shastra a weapon shastra the rule book and shishya somebody who needs to be governed so the whole idea of governing someone as we see today uh i think it was arthur kosler who coined this phrase that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely in fact today's uh, intellectuals seem to be totally mesmerized by this kind of thing and i say mesmerized in harmful way that any time there is any body showing uh, any time power is being exhibited it will tend towards corruption and anywhere you have absolute power then the corruption is absolute and what you are telling and what we read from our vedic wisdom text is a very strange idea today it is it sounds strange that somebody exerts control on keeping their welfare in mind and as you rightly put it what did you say it is not essential but more functional kind of uh, yeah instrumental instrumental yeah not essential but instrumental that was a very nice point okay so I'll, so the shasta dhatu is a very interesting so ultimately the purpose is to have some kind of rule now 
no rules are essentially or you could say rules are specific rule is overall the rule of law we can say so no rules have always uh, rules start seeming restrictive when they are divorced from a purpose so that is what my point is that we have different forms of administration but a different rules the purpose is important so so now there are some quotes of prabhupad which are used to say dismiss democracy and uh, so democracy sometimes are called as demon crazy or you know there is a play of words with abraham lincoln's famous statement i think it is lincoln's isn't it government of the people for the people yes. and by the people so that is sometimes sometimes played around as government of the shudras by the shudras and for the shudras of course here the word shudra is not used in a in a caste sense it is used more in a sense of a person who doesn't know the values of life so now i wonder uh, how valid such statements are they are attractive as sound bites but are they reflective of a mature position on the issue so if we consider uh, why did we may have to go a little bit into the history of democracy why it evolved and as you said that there is the fear and i would say that it is not a unfounded fear that that government sorry that power may corrupt and power has corrupted a lot of people in recent uh, at least in recent recorded human history so maybe we want to go into that direction that you know why how democracy evolved and how those fears are 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 to be addressed fears of autocratic power okay let us say this thing is a very valid in that uh monarchy is absolutely bad i'm not subscribing to that view i'm not asking our viewers to subscribe to that view but i'm saying let us take that as a launch pad for our understanding so if we begin with the umbrella concept of the history of the idea of democracy basically autocracy is a proper word of course autocratic is also used in a little bit of a pejorative sense but then then the governance of the mass kleptocracy government of thieves or uh, all those other bureaucracy everything is just managed by bureaus and so much of red tape of course red tape also is the red tape is to tie those files and if something is tied in that it is never going to be unearthed so that's why the red tape means just a strategy to delay something so we have the greeks who uh, as our philosophers would like to tell us or the western philosophy historians would like to tell us that that greece athens is the place where this idea took root and i think about 3 centuries or so it, it that sapling was nurtured and nourished and that became the founding ground for uh, democracy or democratic ideas in other places the magna carta i think it is a 13th century uh, document where the then great people came together and they curtailed the power of the king <coughs> excuse me of course you have oliver cromwell and uh, i'm just taking a very sweeping kind of a look at things so the idea that somebody comes to remedy the abuse of power and then starts abusing power himself so that was seen here in great britain then we have julius caesar who said that uh, there will be no more emperors but then started behaving like one we have napoleon in france where the 
German composer Beethoven, he was, although they were not exactly French, at that time there was no Germany and no France in that sense. I mean, France was there, but Germany was more like provinces, Prussia and other things. So he actually composed a piece uh, glorifying Napoleon that here is an ideal European statesman, not any power. He's not willing to abuse power at all. By the time he finished making that piece, Napoleon had proclaimed himself emperor of France and was about to conquer in the parts of Italy. And then, of course, the 1812 or so, his march towards Moscow, that fatal thing, and then he came back, defeated, and then in about eight or ten years, that was the end of it. So historians are afraid of power being concentrated in the hand of one person. That one person could be a uh, well-wisher of everyone. It is simply not a tenable thing. People are not just uh, ready to accept that. Mm. Alternatives and especially the biggest experiment against democ against autocratic rule was the 1917 October Revolution in Russia, where a small group of ragtag revolutionaries they overthrew the Tsar, and 1980 when communism itself collapsed, the, the, the prime minister who, Boris Yeltsin became the prime minister and he said, this experiment should not have been done on such a big country. <laughs> mm. Ideally, if it was done in some few villages, a cluster of provinces or districts, then we could have known whether it works or not. So, this is the checkered history of this idea that it is seen as not very tenable, not very productive. But as they say, if I can be allowed to use the word, the best of the worst options. <laughs> okay, that's the best of the worst. So now you're saying checkered history of the idea. Are you talking about checkered history of uh, various forms of political rules or specifically checkered history of autocracy? Autocratic rule, like, uh, monarchy. Like, well. Yeah, more or less the idea is how to avoid monarchy so how that avoid, we don't I, have yeah we don't have the same abuses and same ills, only to find that even in a so-called democratic setup, the human mind is such that it can still have group of people trying to do that. So instead of one person doing the abuse. It could be a small coterie of people doing that. Okay. So the fundamental question that comes down is that how can abuse of power be avoided? In fact, uh, so uh, in political philosophy, the, uh, the, actually what you gave was a very good overview of starting from the Magna, um, especially the Magna Carta is considered to be a like the foundation for the conception of individual rights that defines much of um, uh, Western forms of Anglo-American forms of government. So in political philosophy, there are several defining questions. And one of the questions is that how much power should a government have? Hmm. So Uh, the, whether the government is is uh, whether it is whether it is monarchy or democracy or oligarchy or whatever it is, how much power should they have? So that is the defining question, uh, one of the defining questions of political philosophy. And if we consider even both the quotes, whatever I mentioned about what is attributed to Prabhupada and what is otherwise used, in both cases the concern is the abuse of power. So if there are demoniac people who gain power, then they can abuse power in terrible ways. So from one perspective, earlier I talked about from the scripture that, that the purpose is spiritual. Spiritualization of consciousness is one aspect of uh, uh, the purpose of governance. But another aspect we could say is that even if the government is not very spiritually conducive, 
at least let it not be materially destructive because some people may say that politics doesn't matter i don't i don't care about politics but you know we may not care about politics but politics cares about us in the sense that political changes can affect us and they can affect us in catastrophic ways i met some devotees from uh, from parts of europe in like uh, yugoslavia former yugoslavia and all those places they said that it is just like within a matter of weeks things change so terribly that we were living peacefully and suddenly things start going downhill and all normal life gets suspended something similar has happened in myanmar now we have i am in touch with a few devotees there of course it's not a major thing right now but um, so we could say uh, abuse of power can lead not only to people being spiritually stagnant or spiritually misled but it can also cause enormous misery at the material level in terms of uh, horrendous amounts of exploitation like what you said about the communist rule even in china in russia primarily but russia and china in those two countries 100 million people are said to have been killed without any war it is just the government killing people who were suspected to be opposed to the government in any way so the amount of devastation that can be done is uh, is can be colossal so we could say that the main concern is the abuse of power so it could be demoniac people if we consider demoniac not simply in religious terms the bhagavad gita talks more in terms of behavioral terms than religious terms of the demoniac people and even shudras when some when we use using that word that is also in terms of behavior not in terms of caste so the concern is for the abuse of power so now the abuse of power can happen in two ways one is that there is somebody who is out to abuse power and there is somebody who lets the abuse of power happen so so if the system of government is such that uh, um, those who are governed have very little or no say in the governance then it's almost as like the second factor becomes a non entity there is a abusive person abusive person who can who has abusive tendencies and those who are subordinate have no capacity to resist then it can become disastrous so now from our scriptural perspective to nuance or complicate things a little bit is that abuse of power is considered not only probable but we could say almost predictable in kaliyuga uh, rajanya dasyu what is that word the kings will become plunderers in kaliyuga that's one of the symptoms of kaliyuga yeah mm mm-hmm. so the kings will become plunderers yeah that's you uh, the, so rajan um, the, 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 so they will become thieves and robbers so now if that is already predicted in kaliyuga as a as a something which is likely to happen then it is maybe it is advisable to have a form of governance with some checks and balances to prevent the abuse of power and in today's world maybe the democratic form of government is the one which provides some checks and balances in the traditional forms of government maybe the brahmanas uh, had the capacity to provide checks and balances when druga started becoming abusive the brahmanas stopped him not druga vena the vena became abusive and if some become become someone becomes very abusive then there is uh, people can call the sages and the devtas they call even the lord to descend and so there is so there is the possibility for abuse of power and there is the need for checks and balances to prevent that abuse of power so what form of government can provide that today we don't have brahmanas who have that much power to stop kings stop heads of state and we don't we really can't invoke the lord's presence that easily as is described in scriptures So any thoughts on this yeah i i am tempted to delve a little bit uh, more deeper into vedic history two examples of how uh power is sought by individuals and once they get it even they cannot control 
the to exploit it. One is a fully qualified king. He becomes a Indra and Nahusha. And as soon as becomes Indra, the previous Indra's wife, he says that uh, since now I am the head, so whichever is the Indra's wife, she should be my wife. And Shachi, that's the name of Indra's wife, she said that, well, I can't be unfaithful to my husband. And he doesn't seem to accept that. He said, no, 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 just be ready to receive me, I'm coming. And who are his palanquin carriers? He uses the seven great sages who have a very important role again in governance. The Bhagavatam, that's another topic, we'll take it some other time. He tells them, you have to carry my palanquin. And in haste, he tells them, go faster, go faster. The Sanskrit word is sarpa, sarpa. And that's what they were waiting for. Okay, you are saying sarpa, you become a sarpa. And then he falls down in our middle planetary system, completely bereft of all his good fortune, his bodily uh, beauty, and he becomes a serpent. And secondly is Srimad Bhagavatam's example of Vena. How, if you read carefully the arguments of Vena, they are all very astute. He is telling those sages that I am the representative of Vishnu. I am above sacrifices. I am above rituals. I alone have to be the center of attraction. You should worship me. Now, that cannot be denied because a Vedic king would be glorified. But as you rightly said, the sages understood that as such, this person is, I mean, he, the way he is abusing her, and now he's having that knowledge. So just like a, a simple person, if he is corrupt, he can damage somebody in one particular way. But if a politician, a minister or a head of state or a nuclear scientist or an expert doctor, if they become abusive, the damage is, damage is large, humongous. So how does one uh, utilize that understanding in today's time? I am really, uh, previously I was intrigued, puzzled, but then as the days go by and keep on discussing the topic, Mm, things here. Srila Prabhupada's guru, who founded a movement just like Srila Prabhupada did, although it was to some extent largely confined to India, mm. there was something in the Rangoon, but that time Rangoon also was part of the British Empire, and then missionaries were sent to England and to Germany. Those are two notable places where there. I don't know if there are other places in Europe they were sent. Mm. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, Tibet has 67 centers, 64 in India and three abroad. Okay. Rangoon, Rangu, London and Munich. So he only toyed with the idea. He implemented it. Although historically speaking, it could not be made fully functional. But of all uh, models, he used the railway system of uh, democratic top management it was called, incidentally, governing body commission. So straight away from that leadership model, he suggested that the Gaudiya Mutt be run like that. There should be a governing body commission. There could be governing body commissioners appointed. So right from the beginning, autocratic rule or there's a very popular phrase word used in ISKCON circles, it's called the self effulgence Somebody would be uh, seen as by his own potency, by this power of preaching, means project, finance, funds managed, or so and so. But this democratic leadership was suggested by Prabhupada's uh, spiritual master himself. And as early as the Beginning years of 1970, the 70s decade, Srila Prabhupada, learning from the previous experience, 
started implementing that and it is so far sightedness you can see the difficulties which propad must have faced if the senior most people under him are no more than 6 or 7 years in the womb this is what propad had if he, if he starts the moment in 65 or 66 by 71 he doesn't have anyone seven years six years experience yeah but he implemented this so this kind of and it is fairly democratic proper instituted the voting system sometimes majority vote sometimes four fifth majority those are the details they could change over a period of time but uh since we are now slowly going from a very macro view of the word democracy and the implications of thought to one of our core subjects that is democratic thought in a spiritual movement mm-hmm. so this is some historical uh, overview of what has happened in the last say from 1920 till about 2020 to 100 years or so yes so this is very interesting it's also a good example of how we we will not be representing prabhupad we may not be representing prabhupad appropriately if we reduce him to some sound bites because we have to also look at what he did so oh, also apart i'll come back to the point of the gbc one one argument i have heard that this doesn't necessarily endorse democracy is that this is a counts this is you could say a democracy of brahmanas so what we that is fine and i was i have heard this again i have not seen any explicit statement in chanakya's niti shastra or anywhere else uh, artha shastra also that the brahmanas who would be the council of brahmanas who would be advising the kings in the vedic times they would function democratically so that that council worked on democratic basis now i am not again generally what i have seen is in the ramayana the mahabharat there is one head priest and the head priest gives uh, decisions if you look at the say the assembly of ravan which is not exactly representative of the vedic ash of the vedic culture or we look at the assembly of the kurus where dhritarashtra is on the head it doesn't seem that anything is happening by majority so there's no majority in the sense of the ministers now none of the ministers are usually brahmanas the the there is a council of brahmanas who are advising but whether the king whether they would be like the decisive authorities that that seems to be unlikely they seem to be more of advisory authorities rather than decisive authorities the king was the ultimate decider so so the point i'm making is that even if we draw a precedent from the brahmanical authority the, from the way brahmanas advised the king that doesn't necessarily apply to the gbc which is which is not an advisory body which is an administrative body so what prabhupad has done is and what bhakti sanskar thakur did was significantly resourceful so i read one the pranav prabhu is has done a phd thesis on prabhupad in bhakti sanskar thakur rather and he makes this point that bhaktisiddhant saraswati thakur was was theologically conservative and institutionally innovative very good okay. so he says many things the even the bhagavat uh, guru shishya parampara the idea of brahmanas uh, non brahmanas giving initiation to brahmanas so with many things he was theo- institutionally he was quite innovative although theologically he was conservative so in that sense we can say at least from the remo- recent traditions perspective openness to forms of governance that work that is what uh, ha- there has been an openness to that so these are some thoughts and one more thought i'll make about this and then now why did they choose this i can think of three reasons one is that maybe there is no one acharya who everybody would be able to accept another could be that just the india in hinduism didn't really have a very organized institutional 
structure. So when there is a nationwide movement, or as they envision future, a global movement, for one leader to oversee everything would be difficult. And third could be that again the checks and balances. So it's not just that even if there is one person who is pure enough, they will not be accepted by others. For one person to manage everything might not be so easy because it's just so big. And third is that maybe that one person. For whatever reason, there could be abuse of power. So having a democracy could check, prevent that. So, any thoughts on this? Okay. So, I I think in one discussion many days ago. Uh, now, I would like to turn my rudder to the opposite angle and try to say some good things about a democratic setup. So. Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur preached in British India, not very bothered with the who is ruling. His famous statement to young Abhay Charan was, "Politics can wait. Krishna consciousness cannot wait, and this is more urgent than even uh, the independence movement. Now, this is a big game changer in young Abhay's life. He is wearing khadi. That's a statement." And he didn't go to London to study higher law, become a barrister. That also is a statement. And here is somebody who is saying that Lord Chaitanya's movement is more important. So, Prabhupada, those seeds are sown uh, in Prabhupada's mind. Prabhupada had very little experience of institutional management because he had his business. He would just preach very nicely. And there was this combination of Abhay Babu, as Prabhupada was called in his yesterday days, and Bhakti Raksha Shridhar Maharaj. So they would cooperate in Mumbai. In fact, not very far from our Chopati Center was the August Kanti Gaudiya Mat Center. Forty years, Prabhupada kept that small flame burning in his heart that he needs to. Follow, fulfill the words of his spiritual master. When he was asked that, why did you choose to go to America instead of England? And his simple answer was, well, my uh, the members of the Gaudiya Math they tried their best, but they could not succeed so much in England. And I had no chance of great success or something. So I thought, if I have to fail, let me fail in a new place. Mm. Now, that was a brilliant answer. Shows his humility. But choosing America also shows his pragmatism. In some other conversations, we come to know that, Prabhupada said after Second World War, the British hold on world politics was over. Mm. In in one place. Prabhupada praises the British public that when Churchill became Prime Minister, now he practically was an autocrat. He comes from the nobility, so he has a royal blood in him, and he's made a Prime Minister. And one of his thunderings, I mean, retorts was, "I have not become the Prime Minister in Her Majesty's government to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire." He was very clear that Britain will retain its colonies, but in 1946, the people were aware that we are not in a position to become the boss of the world anymore. So he lost the election, and Mr. Attlee, Clement Attlee, became the prime minister, and he the writings on the wall: "We cannot afford to have this empire," and then. Within few weeks, the divide and rule thing came up. India became independent in August. Pakistan was formed, and later, so many things happened. And within two or three years after that, Churchill again won the election. Oh, so the thing is, yeah. So people need to be politically alert in order for some kind of democracy to actually function. And 
we see that abysmally low quotient of alertness in Asia and Africa, and therefore we have these sham democracies or ballots being stuffed. Some politicians are in jail and they've been elections. And I mean, the, the whole litany of abuses which uh, people heap on the current democratic setup. Coming to my main point, Prabhupada choosing America because the freedom to preach, freedom to your faith in his own mindset was the America afforded the maximum potential for doing that. And I think in 75, when ISKCON was proclaimed as bona fide religion, the New York City court and proper, as a Vaishnav, as a pure devotee, would be expressing gratitude to everybody, Prabhupada would say, I love New York. This city always helped me. I love America. He would tell you Americans, you become Krishna conscious and then one can touch your hair. So, I mean, these are from an Indian sentimental point of view, you can easily understand that no one touches your hair. <laughs> That's not a figure of speech you best. <laughs> We understand. <laughs> <laughs> but we understand that Japan, a big industrial power, but reduced to ashes, there would be a land. Australia, New Zealand, same British people, but so far away. Uh, that time the Middle East was not so rich at all. South America, problem. Russia, communist, no way in the 60s, Prabhupada could have. I mean, the way they got permission to go there for only three days, so much of documentation and the paucity of resources there. So Prabhupada did go to the behind the Iron Curtain, but that was safely uh, going on the resources which he got from preaching in America. And when we say America, we say England also and India Two, when he decided to come back, there were ma the, the only major issues in the Indian Democrat, which were hurdles to ISKCON, where uh, the Americans were seen as members of CIA, they're not exactly sadhus, and uh, some opposition from the smart of Brahmanas, give them Brahmana thread. But otherwise, USA. Europe and Asia primarily. It was the call it sham democracy or call it to whatever democracy, but that setup helped ISKCON to, uh, to lay its foundation in a very firm way. And only, only when the Iron Curtain was destroyed did ISKCON actually start flourishing in the previous USSR and other places. So this could be seen as some good, good points about democracy today. Hmm. So I think there is a lot to cover, a lot of territory you covered here. The point is that whether we look at the institutional engagement of how Prabhupada instituted uh, the Krishna conscious movement or how Prabhupada engaged with the world. It was the democratic form of government where he was successful, not just in sharing Krishna Bhakti there, but also in gaining resources for sharing Krishna Bhakti elsewhere. And um, so there are, so, we, uh, so this is a very valid point when Prabhupada met with uh, the Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, and he had his disciples meet with Moraji Desai. And although, <clears throat> uh, with respect to, in, with, with the meeting with Indira Gandhi, he had a list of suggestions, which he never, he never uh, really could talk because she was under a murder threat at that time. But with Moraji Desai, it seems to be, he sent his disciples to meet, and it was, a, it was more of a, just a getting together getting to know each other sort of meeting. So Prabhupada, it seems that uh, going back to that point of 
Prabhupada was pragmatic in his choose choice of America. So we can also say Prabhupada would have been pragmatic in his choice of, if at all somebody had consulted him for about a government, form of governance, he would have been pragmatic. So a democracy, another, uh, now to move forward, if we consider the challenges in democracy, uh, can I move to the third part now about what we, what we as a spiritual tradition can offer to, if we say that more or less democracy is the de facto form of government now. So what can we offer, say, from our tradition? So first is, is it compatible? Well, we could say broadly it is compatible. We may not necessarily say that that is the recommended form of government by scripture, but it's definitely compatible. And we could also use the principle of Yukta Vairagya that, okay, whatever is there, we engage with it, we use it. So now there are, we could say that this is the spiritual movement and this is the political government. So at one level, at the very least, what we would, we would want is that the political government not interfere with the spiritual movement, provide, provide the freedom to do what to do our spiritual outreach. So beyond that, we can say that maybe the ideal situation, this is going to become a more expansive discussion and we, uh, you can decide whether you want to go in this direction or not. With, uh, there is apprehension always that that in the, in the ideal situation as described in the Vedic texts, the spiritual movement would be facilitated actively by the political government. Say like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was facilitated by Pratap Rudra. Now in today's world, where it's, we, are a, we live in a secular world with a multicultural environment, that immediately raises specters of theocracy. And to have a government which will actually support a, a spiritual movement explicitly, that is going to be very improbable, we could say. So we could say that the ideal where spirituality as explained in the Vedic scriptures is not sectarian, it is universal and it will help everyone. That's true. But the fear of theocracy will make this a very difficult pro 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 proposal to even, even explain what to speak of establish. So we can keep that aside and then look at the interaction between the two. At the very least, we can say that the spiritual movement should not be impeded by the political government. Hmm? Beyond that, we can say, what can the political government provide to the spiritual movement? They can, as I said, provide freedom, provide protection, basically. Not in the sense that protection to have one's religious rights. Hmm. I remember Shruti Dharma Prabhu. Uh, he was quite a pioneer for our movement in... Uh, uh, in making ISKCON, in one sense, the mainstream voice of Hinduism in UK. And he was invited once to, he was in, he told me that he was invited to, uh, to the Diwali festival and he was asked to give a talk. And it was a very brief talk that the, the, because they have multicultural environment, they celebrate various festivals. So the Prime Minister and many other politicians were there. So... He was asked to explain the spirit of Diwali. He said that there, I just have two, three minutes. Uh, so he just spoke something like, I'm paraphrasing. He said, Diwali is the festival of lights. So light signifies wisdom. Light signifies growth. Light, light, light enables growth. So he said, and for the wisdom and the growth that is possible, we are grateful. So he, I, I'm oversimplifying what he said, but the essential point he said that, uh, that we, Diwali is a, is a, celebration for gratitude that traditionally when the citizens came back when the citizens of Ayodhya they welcomed Ram but what can we be grateful for so one of the things he said we can be grateful for our, our country which is provided as the religious freedom to practice our faith and he said that many of the politicians were very appreciative of that statement so we could say that the government can provide us protection and facilities for practicing our faith and what can the spiritual movement offer to the government? So we could say that 
should i go to that point or you want to add something at this point and then no 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 this is where we conclude that how we can visit that we can uh, if we expect some kind of benefits from a democratic setup what is it that we can offer in return since gratitude is a the theme please continue on that yeah okay so we could say that at one level uh, the mem- this members of the spiritual movement can be socially conscious socially responsible you know be make informed choices and not just ostracize the political form of government but engage with it and we see that that sort of engagement has be, become more prominent i think in, in the last political elections in india also there were pictures on social media of the brahmacharis voting so irrespective of whom they vote for the what to speak of brahmacharis and grahasthas also so at one level is we don't be apathetic apathetic we be socially conscious and uh, we we act as responsible law abiding citizens uh, beyond that we could say that if the spiritual principles are understood more and applied more whether it is by the leaders or by the followers by the citizens then that can be one of the best insurances to prevent abuse of power because usually abuse of power comes when one thinks that this life is everything and i want to be at the top in this life but if you understand that we have a eternal life and we are accountable for our actions and there are greater things to be higher than power in this world our life is meant for something more than power in this world then the likelihood of abuse of power will be much lesser and quite, so that will be from the point of view of if we can offer some input to the leaders and in the citizens also become little more spiritually minded even if they don't become spiritually minded even if by some spiritual practices they rise to the mode of goodness then they can also make more informed choices otherwise when to the extent somebody is in the mode of passion or ignorance they are more likely to be manipulated and abused manipulated and exploited emotionally manipulated we have vote bank politics we have so many uh, we so, so many ways in which people can get misled so that way spiritual wisdom can contribute to enhancing or making more effective the existing form of government also any thoughts on this yeah so basically uh this is this is the last point from from my side that spiritual institutions like we is not the head of the complete buddhist world there could be 40 60 denominations he is seen as a figure head he is seen as somebody symbolizing the pacifist non violent his people are persecuted but he is not causing an armed uprising rather he is spreading wisdom he is spreading ideas spreading peace so i'm just using that as an example so when propat was it world also knew him and propat would say i am the founder acharya but many of his disciples in their private memoirs are now revealing that numerous occasions propat would consult them now that was like a dual purpose was it what what was it to train them for their future role or he actually trusted them that now you are also experienced you can also contribute something now that as i have heard from harishori prabhu and uh, prabhu that that gave them tremendous confidence and so whether a spiritual is governed by one person which kind of resembles a theocratic rule or a autocratic rule or is or it is managed by a collective wisdom like we have as you rightly said gbc is more like a brahmanical body but at the same time it is described as the ultimate management authority mm. so brahmanical body also has a management role now they may engage kshatriyas or kshatri equally oriented devotees to help them they may have a shastrik body to help them with theological issues and they may also have like this thing was passed with a simple majority 
but to make somebody into a renunciate, a sannyasi or not, there could be a four-fifth majority. That depends on time, place and circumstances. So if we are also following what the world outside is following, so we prevent theocratic abuse or abuse of funds within the spiritual movement, that could be a bigger preaching to the outside world where we can also share our wisdom. Otherwise, outside people say, hey, if, if one industrialist is abusing power, somebody has purchased hectares and hectares of land and has removed the indigenous people. And so that's the kind of abuse we see from multinational companies being hit. Or uh, you heard of the term, the sweatshops, where people are, labor is used, they are paid miserably low wages. So these are the kind of abuses which people are angry when trade and commerce-based uh, units do that. But when people are, their, their faith is being shattered or their funds are being misused for something, so or worse, physical, physical emotional, uh, that kind of abuse takes place. So the outside world is concerned that we may not be able to trust somebody even in a so-called spiritual organization where uh, show us whether you have any democratic setup where and primarily means just my two cents understanding is there a chance for a debate is there a chance for some to be viewed that is one major thing do you have the freedom to speak your views Am I, am I going in the right direction or you would have some other rights also? No, that's a very important point that uh, how is dissent dealt with? How is the very difference of opinions dealt with? Are they crushed or are they engaged with? That's a very important parameter today. And one more point we could say in some ways is that uh, the world today is far more complicated than what it is in what it was in the past and uh, the forms of governance which are there in today's complicated world they are also much more complicated so it would even if we presume that there would be one well intentioned and uh, virtuous head of state who would not abuse power but still for one person to run everything there would be there would be the need for a competent team and that competent team would eventually need to have power so uh, in one i mean i would like to summarize this by saying that uh, in one sentence is that ultimately the purpose of the government is not to empower the head of state. It is to empower the citizens. Empower the citizens to make wise choices. Empower the citizens to make wise choices in terms of uh, providing the external resources to make wise choices. So for example, democracy, like you mentioned, it doesn't work well if the public is not well educated and well aware, if there is not a, prop, a free and unbiased media, if there is no forum for public discussion and debate. So democracy doesn't work. So there are those external facilities which are required and the government needs to empower people for that, especially in today's complicated world so that uh, so that sound solutions will come up. And also the go uh, people need to be empowered internally, internally in terms of knowing what are the values worth striving for in life. What is life meant for ultimately? So... The way to prevent abuse of power is to actually, uh, in one sense, em educate people and empower people about the purpose of power. So then, um, then if we see most of the, I'll, uh, this is going to become a big subject, but quickly, if we see the government, the, even if the king was autocratic, or there's a monarchy in India, as far as we know, or even in the West, as far as we know, the change of the head of state didn't really affect 
people so much because authority was distributed whether they have the self sufficient village systems and usually the villages would be run by some kind of uh, some kind of system of administration and as long as the taxes were given upward people would have their facilities so if that was there in a much simpler age in the past in a more complicated age for even materially competent administration distribution of power is the way ahead in my understanding and prabhupa did that to through that the gb to the gbc and to the extent we can empower individuals to choose wisely both by curbing their internal passions and by providing uh, external resources external education other things to that extent there is the likelihood of to that extent we can create the best settings for the proper use of power and avoid the abuse of power or decrease the probability of abuse of power any concluding thoughts on this no would you like to summarize yes definitely i'll try this is a this is a big subject yeah so we talked about three main themes one is so the topic was broadly spirituality and democracy we could say so it was so the vedic tradition uh, what was the purpose of governance it was at one level to raise people's consciousness to the spiritual level and we talked about at one level to raise at a positive level raise consciousness to spiritual level at a negative level don't exploit and abuse people so we have examples of that happening in the vedic scriptures and when that happens they give you the example of vena and uh, then there are che- there are checks and balances to prevent that and uh, then we also talked about the you mentioned the history of how from greece to magna carta to the to the modern times through napoleon and then through the american charter of rights and other things how because of the repeated experience of the abuse of powers whether it was by a person who was like napoleon was considered an ideal king by by was it beto beethoven and then yeah. then the <clears throat> the czars were replaced by communist rulers which were not exactly autocratic but eventually it became autocratic under stalin and lenin and that created a disaster so recent human history does seem to indicate that there is a high chance of abuse of power whenever power is concentrated in one or few hands and that is predicted in our scriptures also that kings are likely to become plunderers so we need a system which checks and balances and then we talked about how within our own movement so prabhu bhakti uh, sansad thakur and then prabhu pad in the very early days of his movement uh, they instituted a, a democratic form of government through the gbc and uh, so bhakti sansad thakur was a theologically conservative but institutionally he was innovative and prabhu pad also engaged prabhu pad was pragmatic in terms of how he did his outreach how he fulfilled his mission so it was america which is a democratic form of government gave him facilities to spread krishna consciousness in america and also it uh, also provided resources for his outreach in other parts of the world also so if we consider the political the political mo- government and the spiritual movement we could see the interactions at the basic level is that in today's world the spiritual movement being fully supported by a political government is unlikely because of uh, the nature of multicultural society and the fear of theocracy so what we can have is that the spiritual the the political government provides freedom for the practice and practice of one's faith and for sharing one's faith in appropriate ways so that is one mode of interaction the other mode of interaction could be that the spiritual movement trains people to be responsible and socially conscious so that they act as law abiding citizens beyond that the spiritual movement can also provide a spiritual vision of life if leaders assimilate that vision they are less likely to abuse power if citizens uh, internalize that vision and they will also rise to the rise to the mode of goodness and then they are able to choose wise choose better so 
for dem uh, for democracy to also work better if individuals are empowered then that is the best best uh, way ahead in today's world and uh, you also mentioned in the interim of how when prabhupad engaged um, at one level you quoted prabhupad in bakshan's conversation that the political the specifics of the political government even the independence was not so relevant so prabhupad would be pragmatic we can say that and whatever works for taking we could also talk about the principle of yukta vairagya whatever works for at least preventing abuse of power and for facilitating uh, facilitating uh, the spiritualization of consciousness we can move ahead with that so any concluding thoughts no nicely summarize everything so thank you very much this was a very thank you so much great krishna great krishna